This episode is brought to you by Smart Food, the sweet, salty snack you need this holiday season. Air pop popcorn, tossed in delicious white cheddar cheese, or mixed with sweet caramel and cheddar. It's the perfect snack for your smart holiday party. Shop now at snacks.com. Schadenfreude? Everybody must have screamed, ah! He's a sung hero. A little pushy pushy. Are you back from listening to Stairway to Heaven twice? Now those are just words I looked up on the internet. Unreasonable Doubt, a podcast about West Virginia University basketball, starts now. Salutations. From the studio in Nitro, West Virginia, this is Unreasonable Doubt. It's a podcast about West Virginia University basketball, part of the Basketball Podcast Network. I'm Joshua Witt, and this is episode four, the University of Pennsylvania Quakers. What were we trying to ascertain tonight? You know, it reminds me of Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, and we've all read that classic novel from Pynchon. Nobody could explain what happened truly have you have you we've all truly read it but do you truly understand what's on the pages of that novel what came from the genius mind of of one thomas pinchon uh it's above uh not to not to go lowbrow here it's it's above my pay grade i do know it's a literary classic and tonight wvu's offense was a classic it was not literary, but they were literally really good at offense tonight. And they achieved their high watermark of the season as far as points produced in a 40 minute game. 92 points for the Mountaineers in a 92 to 58 romp over the Pennsylvania Quakers. Second time WVU has played at an Ivy League school in my lifetime, both times the University of Pennsylvania. I, I can't do that. I can't. I can't do that. I can't do that the whole episode. Listen, I I don't remember his first half or second half, but there was a point where there was a loose ball, three Mountaineers on their stomachs trying to get the ball. The ball flies out of bounds. Camera cuts to Bob Huggins, and what is he doing? It's not a golf clap. It's a round of applause, and that was his favorite part of this game. Uh, and there was lots of made shots. And there was a fast start instead of a slow start. And West Virginia held Penn to 35% shooting. But that five-person scrum that didn't even result in, in, in a basket, it just, the ball just whipped out of bounds, uh, that was Basketball Hall of Fame coach Bob Huggins' best and favorite part of the game. And so I, I don't know how much you read from this game. They were saying during the broadcast that – that Penn is picked to be the best team in the Ivy League. And so that I guess that's good for computer ratings and stuff like that. West Virginia was the better team tonight in not all facets, but definitely enough facets, and we knew it very early on. And probably the biggest part of the fast start was guard play. Talked about it in the last episode, West Virginia – their guards were 8 for 32 from the field. Much better tonight. 17 of 27 from the field. Arm sleeve East Steve. He made his first eight shots. He was laughing. He was making baskets. He was making threes. He was making mid-range shots. He got to the basket. Joe Toussaint questioning him shooting not close to the rim. He, he made three threes tonight. I, I got to shut up. And respect that Joe Toussaint made three threes. Keity Johnson was getting to the rim, and he was doing that early. Josiah Davis. There was a Josiah Davis sighting tonight. He made his first collegiate basket for the Mountaineers. The guards were solid. Big guys, not so much. Big guys as a whole did not have a strong night. Yes, Trey Mitchell made his first four shots. I mean, we got to halftime. Trey Mitchell hadn't missed. And arm sleeve East Steve hadn't missed. Second half for Mitchell, he missed he misses three shots that he took in the second half. Josiah Harris. Uh I guess you need a guy like this 
and he's a freshman. So freshman, you know, think of one Kobe Johnson. His first season was last year. I still feel, and then he was very aggressive for Kobe Johnson tonight against the Penn Quakers. But last year seemed very reserved, definitely wanted to defer. And when Josiah Harris gets in the game, uh, my man is not deferring. If you throw him the ball, he's going to shoot the ball. He's probably not going to dribble. <laughs> I mean, there was one possession. He gets the ball on the wing, and somebody's on him, and the ball goes up. And it did It did not go into the basket. So I'm, I don't guess I'm against the attitude of, like, I'm going to come in and I'm going to get shots up. I'm good with that. <laughs> but 20, 24 seconds left on the shot clock, and you're shooting it. I don't know. I guess we there could have been a better shot. Who's to say? So Harris is still doing that. He's consistent, so he's still doing that. But the big guys, Jimmy Bell, Mo Wagi, James Okongwo, they were combined. They had a combined nine rebounds between those three guys. Wagi played nine minutes, did not make a field goal, did not have a rebound. He was part of that five-person scrum. So he was part of the highlight of the night for Bob Huggins. But the box score says that Waggy is first kind of not an off night. It's hard to say that anybody had an off night when everybody that that got in the game scored and everybody that's on your bench got to play. That's a rare bird that everybody scores. Waggy didn't have a field goal, but he did have three free throws. But only nine rebounds for the three big guys. And the Penn Quakers had 13 more offensive rebounds at WVU. Again, West Virginia won by 34. So, you know, that is going to affect rebounding stats if you make a lot of shots. But it doesn't affect what you're doing as far as keeping the other team off of offensive rebounds. So, obviously, Huggins after the game was concerned about rebounding and looking at that on the box score and saying, yeah, we got it. We're not there rebounding. And that totally makes sense. Here's the counter argument to that. How could WVU not keep Penn off the boards? Did you see the guys getting offensive rebounds for Penn? How do you stop that? How do you stop Nick Spinoso? How do you, like you can try to box out six foot six Max Martz? <laughs> Like you could try, you can use whatever rebounding techniques you have against Max Martz, but we all knew this going into this game that Max Martz is basically a walking double double. And he did it again tonight 10 points, 10 rebounds. Those guys were getting putbacks against Jimmy Bell, against Muhammad Wagi against James Oconquo. And those guys, those are big guys. Those are strong guys. Talked about Jimmy Bell being immovable. He did his thing on the offensive glass. But on the defensive side, how do you keep Martz and Spinoso? They were basically, and let's just be honest here, they were like a, a tag team, a pro wrestling tag team. Axe and smash of demolitions. The Rockers. Any other 80s and 90s tag team that I can think of and that's where my that's where my knowledge is limited like I mean I don't know what you do there like West Virginia did their best 6'10 285 Jimmy Bell did his best against six foot six Max Martz and but there's only so much you can do it doesn't matter how big you are Max Martz is going to get his right but not a ton to complain about, not a lot to glean from this game or things that you can figure out. I've got this weird thing where I feel like WVU has a certain amount of three-point shots that they're going to make in a season. And that's true. At the end of each season, they've made a, however many threes they've made. When I'm watching WVU not miss threes, in my mind, I feel like, they have a certain number of threes. Internally, they know how many threes they're going to make in the year. And you can spend your threes however you want throughout the season, right? And this is absolutely asinine. 
This, this is not how it works. How would you know how many threes you're going to make for the year? It doesn't make any sense. But in my mind, when it's happening, it's like, hey, I think we've got this one under control, guys. <laughs> you know what? Once you've built the 10-point lead in, in four minutes, then you feel like things are going your way. Can we, can we save these threes for Kansas? Can we save these threes for Purdue? You know what I mean? And it doesn't work like that. But that's where my mind goes when Eric Stevenson can't miss and Joe Toussaint is making three threes and Kedrian Johnson is making a three and Jamel King's making a three. Like everybody made a three. And I want them to make shots. But also, (laughs) I want them to make those shots against a Gonzaga, against a Baylor. You know what I mean? Anyways, that's not how it works. But WVU shot 58%. Penn did not. It's nice to not be nervous in a game that West Virginia is supposed to win. So that's a that's a win for all of us, right? But the next game is not against Penn. The competition definitely increases for the Thanksgiving tournament that WVU will be participating in. NBA fans, the NBA action is just getting started, and so are the incredible offers at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 NBA pregame money line bet and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Check this out. Right now, everyone can earn up to a 100% boost with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, place a same-game parlay, and combine multiple bets like which team will win, total rebounds, total points scored, and more. Listen, Javon Carter, when he starts in the NBA, that team wins this season. So maybe pick the Milwaukee Bucks to win, pick them to win by a large margin, have Javon Carter scoring more than four points, Boom. Same game parlay. With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is where I go to bet on the NBA. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TBPN. Make any $5 bet this week and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code TBPN. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. You've heard the phrase, you learn something new every day. The thing that I learned today, the new thing, was very confusing. But at the end of the day, it's something that I've learned, and I want to share what I've learned today with you. And so you, ha- if you haven't marked off the list of you learn something new every day, whenever you're listening to this, here's your chance. And if you already knew this, my apologies. But it came early on in the broadcast of this WVU pin game. Very standard fare at the beginning of a broadcast. You get pictures of who's in the starting five with names. And then soon after that, you get the camera focused on the head coach. And then you have words on the screen, like verifying or confirming who we're looking at. So for Bob Huggins, it'll say Bob Huggins head coach. Typically, it'll have his like career record or some kind of stat to you know thirteen seasons at, at West Virginia or whatever winning percentage that kind of deal, right? So then the camera tonight went to the pin head coach, and this is where I learned something new. First of all, his name is Steve Donahue. And I I knew that already because I had done just a little bit of research about the Penn Quakers prior to the game. So I knew that their head coach was Steve Donahue, but that's not what the screen said. I mean, I think it did say head coach, but then it also said other things. And it was confusing because at some point it's like, okay, Steve Donahue on Ken Pomeroy's website, he's the head coach. It just says head coach colon Steve Donahue, but that's not it. Steve Donahue is not the head coach of Penn. Steve Donahue, and again, he's doing head coach things. 
you're watching him throughout the game. He's calling, you know, he's making the substitutions. He's the first guy in the handshake line at the end of the game. He's the first guy to shake Bob Huggins' hands. All things are pointing to Steve Donahue being the head coach. But on the screen, when it when it identified Steve Donahue, it said that Steve Donahue was the John R. Rockwell head coach of Penn. And that's where I learned something now. Because at first, and I've I've complained on this podcast about the production quality that ESPN Plus brings to the table. When I saw that Steve Donahue was the John R. Rockwell head coach, obviously I thought there was an inside joke being on the screen that the folks at ESPN Plus just forgot to take out of the graphic. You know what I mean? John R. Rock, Rockwell. Well, obviously the production person likes the 1980s one-hit wonder artist Rockwell with his number one hit. I, I don't know if it's number one or not. Somebody's watching me. And then trying to piece it all together, this person likes Rockwell, and the person who likes Rockwell, their name is John Richardson. This is the story I have in my head, that John Richardson loves Rockwell, John R. Rockwell. And it is, in fact, not an inside joke that ESPN Plus accidentally left on the screen. That's the official title of the head coach at the University of Pennsylvania. (laughs) Steve Donahue is, in fact, the John R. Rockwell head coach. Pennsylvania, Ivy League school, this John R. Rockwell was a guy on the Penn Athletic Board, and he has an endowment for the men's head basketball coach. So Steve Donahue, whoever fills that role, they are, until future notice, the John R. Rockwell head coach. Then I go to Penn's website, and they have so many coaching endowments. And my man John R. Rockwell, he's not he he not only uh and rest in power, John R. Rockwell. He's not only the men's basketball, John R. Rockwell head coach, he's also the John R. Rockwell assistant coach of men's lightweight crew. That's like uh, rowing, right? Crew. But George A. Munger head coach for football and Albert G. Malloy head coach for men's tennis. So many coaches have endowments with somebody's name on it. And on that website, there's there's plenty of coaches that don't have an endowment. So for a substantial amount of money, you could be, <laughs> and I don't want to say how much, just think of a, a large amount of money, like large amount of money. You could have your name ahead of the words head coach. And not that somebody will say it out loud, like I'm saying it out loud now. I don't remember... Tony Caridi's son or Warren Baker saying and addressing Steve Donahue as the John R. Rockwell head coach, but you get the graphic on the screen. Okay. So that's something that I didn't know. I'm glad that this exists with the recent athletic director change, you know, listening and reading things some of the things that are coming out is that possibly uh, Shane Lyons firing had something to had something to do with the amount of donors and the amount of money coming in through the Mountaineer Athletic Club. Maybe WVU should look at this, putting the, you know, give us a, a large amount of money and we'll put your name in front of head coach. Are you telling me, that it's not possible in the future that the men's basketball coach could be the baby dog head coach. You're telling me that couldn't be a thing? Because I'm telling you it absolutely could be a thing. You're flipping on a WVU football game and the sideline reporter starts talking to, let's just throw out a name, random name, Jimbo Fisher. And the sideline reporter doesn't say that they're talking to the Kim Webster head coach, Jimbo Fisher, but you see on the screen, on the graphic, 
that it's Kim Webster, head coach Jimbo Fisher. You're telling me that doesn't – it made me Google lots of things. It made me spend a, more time than I'd care to admit figuring out who uh, my, my man John R. Rockwell was and that it wasn't an inside joke. Mountaineer Athletic Club, this is maybe something for you. And again, you don't get – it's not said out loud, but you can read it in perpetuity, I think. Just something for the new athletic director, whoever that is, to consider. This episode of Unreasonable Download is sponsored by Freeman Sports Cards and Collectibles. Went up to the attic, opened up the shoebox, and I've got baseball cards. I've got basketball cards. I think I've got a few Andre Dawson cards. Very few rookie cards of any note. I've got some gold skybox cards. I got a little, I, I know I've got a Detlef Shrimp. I know I've got an Irvin Johnson. I've got a lot of Seattle Supersonics basketball cards. I, ke- I kept a hold of those. A couple of football cards, some old Marvel Comics cards. I'm telling you this because I'm thinking about calling Freeman Sports Cards and Collectibles 304 416 3631. Call them up and say, hey, I've got I've got eight very good condition Andre Dawson cards. And they may want them. I don't know. They're always looking to buy sports cards, action wrestling figures, comic books. But you should give them a call. 304-416-3631. Also, December 2nd through 4th, they'll have a sports card show at the Morgantown Mall. Check that out when it comes along. Freeman Sports Cards and Collectibles. Now the schedule ramps up in difficulty. It's awesome that WVU is 4-0. Now you leave Morgantown, you go to the opposite side of the country, and you play in the Field Night Legacy Tournament. And this is a stacked tournament. This is not the Anaheim Classic, and it's not the Cancun Challenge. And this is not South Dakota. What was that place called? The Fortress? Whatever that place was called. This is the Phil Knight, you know, Phil Knight, owner of Nike, CEO of Nike, his legacy tournament in beautiful Portland, Oregon. The first game is established. WVU will play Purdue Thanksgiving night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ESPN2. And Purdue... I guess this is good news. They start two freshman guards. So that on paper, that's a positive in that you don't know what you're typically going to get with freshman guards or freshman period. There are exceptions. But Purdue also starts a real-life giant. Like not, oh, that guy's really big. Or like Jimmy Bell, he's a big dude. He's 6'10", 285. Zach Eady, 7'4", 290. Actual giant, not George Murison giant, but seven four. That's <laughs> that's a giant. And I was telling my friend, one of my friends, that West Virginia is going to face a giant in their next game at Purdue. And my friend rightfully said, "When does Purdue not have a giant?" And so I had to look. When's the last time <laughs> Purdue didn't have a giant? And you've got to go back to the 2011-2012 season. That's the last time Purdue did not have a seven-footer on their roster. And sometimes they've had two seven-footers on their roster. They grow seven-footers at Purdue. And the latest one is one Zach Eady. So that's going to be a challenge. He's going to be a handful. But they have four freshmen in their rotation. Uh, You know, West Virginia, I think, is going to play a solid game. This team has plenty of confidence. So let's see what they do against some inexperience and a giant in Purdue. Now, if West Virginia beats Purdue, they're going. I'll just say this: I'm not trying to jinx Gonzaga. Gonzaga is playing Portland State. Uh, if West Virginia wins the first game, they're playing. I'm going out on a limb here. They're going to play Gonzaga. And when you look, when you look at the Phil Knight Legacy Tournament, there are 
ghost of WVU lost past all over the place. You start with Purdue, and I don't have – the Final Four team played Purdue. They got stomped at Purdue. Bob Huggins has not done well in his dealings in public with Purdue. I've heard he's done pretty well in secret scrimmages against Purdue, but not great in front of a camera, in front of a bunch of people. So if you get past that ghost, <laughs> that haunting of the past – then you play Gonzaga and West Virginia, and Bob Huggins has never defeated Mark Few and a Gonzaga team. Oh, for however many times they played Gonzaga. And they've all been in this, you know, fairly recently, and they've all been Bob Huggins' teams, but they've lost to Gonzaga multiple times in the NCAA tournament. They lost the game in the AM one time at Gonzaga when ESPN used to do the 24 hours of college basketball. Gonzaga's came to Morgantown and beat WVU. Everywhere, Gonzaga wins. And so if if West Virginia beats Purdue, that's who they've got waiting for them is Gonzaga. And then win or lose, they're going to play one of four teams that have, uh, you know, not great. I don't have great memories of these teams, West Virginia playing them. Duke, I have a really great memory of Joe Alexander putting it on Duke, but the last memory I have of Duke, 2010, Final Four. Oregon State, I don't have any. There's no There's no hauntings there. Have no, I actually have a fondness for Oregon State, alma mater of Gary Payton. Uh, alma mater of Gary Payton Jr.? And they made a run in the in the NCAA tournament here recently, right? So no ill will towards Oregon State. Florida's had our number. They canned Mike White, and Mike White mopped the floor with Bob Huggins, it felt like. And then Xavier. And the last memory I have of West Virginia playing Xavier was very early in the Bob Huggins era at WVU and in a Sweet 16 game losing to Xavier in overtime against a Xavier team coached by Sean Miller. So no ties to Oregon State. That'd be an absolute rock fight. Oregon State likes to play slow, really good at defense. So there's trouble everywhere in this tournament. I don't know if Portland State's a lot of trouble with love and respect to Portland State. But I think if WVU comes out of this Portland tournament – two and one, however it comes. If they can get two wins out of this tournament, then I'm going to feel great about it. I'm going to feel great about two and one. Won't feel as great if they win the first two games, somehow get to the final and then lose. That's not a great feeling. If you get to the championship, bring home the trophy, right? Put it in the practice facility. But two and one, however it comes, satisfied, WVU is not going to go undefeated, so 2-1 and one would be great. But what if? What if it's a trip to get to exercise some demons? You know what I mean? What if it's time to tell Matt Painter to take a hike and call him Perdont and give Mark Few an L against WVU and then maybe beat a Blue Devil or tell Sean Miller, uh, hey, not this time, pal. You know what I mean? If somehow that happens, then <laughs> before the season, just loving the low expectations, I got to I would get to enjoy that for for three weeks of a basketball season. <laughs> because if they bring the Phil Knight Legacy Trophy home, then that low expectation stuff goes out the window. Then WVU is seven and zero. And bar the doors, <laughs> especially with football being where it's at, and an interim athletic director, a seven and zero basketball team with wins over Purdue, Gonzaga, and let's just say Duke. Uh, there are going to be things said that people will not want to take back that they actually are going to feel in their in their mind. That's going to sound absolutely insane if you said it if you said it three weeks ago. So 
I don't I I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying if if it goes that way, then we've just got to buckle up. <laughs> Cuz then then it's like you're, I don't even want to say some things that could be said. I already saw something tonight from one of the current players on the team uh, that sounded that reading it, it it sounded crazy, but it's coming from a place of confidence, and I respect that. That's it for this episode of Unreasonable Doubt. It's on the YouTube. Check it out. Unreasonable. Look, what is it? YouTube.com slash at Unreasonable Doubt Pod, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, all the places you listen to podcasts, however you got here. Keep listening on that. Hit the follow or subscribe button, rate five stars, all the stuff. Until next time, I'm Josh Witt. This has been Unreasonable Doubt, WVU, for the 2022-2023 season. They have four wins and they have zero losses.